The medic leaned over the patient, Rebecca Jordan. She was on a presser bed and the fields held her firmly to the cushion like a giant hand. She struggled, but the harder she tried, the stronger the field became. She managed a scream. Easy, Rebecca. Easy. It's only a dream. You're fine. Everything is okay. Newt's breath came in gasps. Her heart pounded. She could feel her pulse in her temple as she stared up at Dr. Jaren. The indirect light gleamed on the sterile white walls and ceiling of the medical center room. Only a dream, just like the others. Dreams again? Do you want to talk about them? Jaren asked. Why? It won't make any difference. He had a kindly face. He was old enough to be Newt's grandfather. He had treated her for years, ever since she'd come to Earth. For the dreams. They weren't all the same. Usually she dreamed about Acheron, the world on which she'd been born. It had been 13 years since the nuclear incident that destroyed the colony. And still the dreams came, carrying her on wild and uncontrollable gallops through her nights. The drugs didn't help. Counseling, hypnosis, biofeedback, brainwave synthesization, nothing helped. She could hear voices in her dream, a distant overlay of ghostly sound wound among the shimmering and frightful images. Dreaming again. What did you give her? Thirty of trimonine. Thirty? That's twice the usual dosage. Aren't you worried about brain damage? Well, that's a risk, isn't it? She's already halfway insane, and none of the conventional therapies work. Besides, medical-grade androids have taken up to 40 milligrams without significant damage. She's not an android, though. Might as well be. Newt felt a coldness grip her legs, bands of rough steel encircling her ankles, pulling her knees apart. She blinked, glanced down, saw she was half-naked. Something wet and slimy dripped onto her bare belly, a clear, ropey jelly. She looked up, but couldn't see the source. There was a kind of fog hovering over her, only centimeters from her face, a featureless gray. I need you, came a deep voice. No, not a voice. The words were unspoken. They were in her mind. They were the thoughts of a lover, but not a human lover. The fog swirled away, and teeth glittered under a coat of clear slime. White needles set in a massive black jaw on a long, impossibly long head that flared into wide, flat, branched antlers. Newt gasped, fear filling her, every cell in her body straining to contain it. Lean back. Unable to resist the command, Newt arched her neck, saw just behind her a massive, fleshy egg easily the size of a garbage can. Flaps at the top of the egg opened, spidery webbing stretching and breaking. It was like the blossoming of some obscene flower, petals spreading wide in a photographic time-lapse hurry. Crab-like legs reached over the folded flaps, long, fleshless finger bones with sharp tips, questing, exploring, looking for something. Looking for Newt. She opened her mouth to scream, and a glob of the slime from the monster above her fell onto her chin, oozed into her mouth, over her cheeks, into her eyes. Newt tried to swallow, but it was too much. I need you. The monster's thoughts tried to soothe. Do not be afraid. It will be good. No! Newt came up on the cot, yelling the word. Easy, easy, Hick said. He was next to her, holding her shoulders. Up and at him, people, came a voice from the entrance to the cell. A pair of armed guards stood there. The general wants to see you, one of them said. As it would turn out, General Spears had a change of heart regarding what to do with the prisoners when Powell brought some information about their backgrounds. Spears confirmed, as did the government before the mission to the alien homeworld prior, that Hicks had a unique viewpoint in that he's had experience with the aliens in the past. This was something he could use. Spears invited his prisoners to break bread. The table was, nearly as Hicks could tell, black glass, expensive for an officer's mess on some back rocket planetoid. Of course, it could have been made from local mineral and not brought in on ship. Even so, it was not something you expected to see. The chairs were some kind of basic fold-out issue, but they'd been padded and spiffed up by somebody with skill and time. 
Newt was sitting to his left, occupying one end of the table. Another dozen people could sit along the sides, but those chairs were empty. Spears sat at the other end, alone. A platter of what looked to be roast meat sat in front of him. It's not real beef, of course, Spears said. Protein, hard gel, and soy, but our mess sergeant has a deft touch with seasonings. It's not bad. With his hat off, Spears was as bald as an egg. Nothing but eyebrows and lashes from what Hicks could see. When the plates had been delivered to Hicks and Newt, along with glasses of red liquid, wine perhaps, and eating implements, the general carved himself a slice. The general raised his glass. To the core, he said. What the hell, Hicks thought. He lifted his own glass. The wine wasn't bad. Hicks had surely drunk a lot worse. Eat, the general said. The cook was inspired, Hicks had to admit. The counterfeit beef was as good as any he'd ever had. Right texture, right flavor. If Spears hadn't had told him, he wouldn't have known the difference. Whatever was going on inside Newt's head, Hicks could see she was enjoying her meal too. Food okay? The general asked, around a mouthful of it. Hicks nodded. Very good. This was strange territory, and wherever this conversation was going, they decided to play along. For his part, Hicks was pretty sure this guy's wingnuts were dogged down too tight. It didn't make sense to set him off until they had some idea of what he was all about. You'll have to excuse my somewhat abrupt manner when we met, Spears said. There's a war on. One can't be too cautious. He smiled. It has been brought to my attention that you have had considerable experience with wild strain aliens, Sergeant Hicks. Hicks chewed on his beef, swallowed it. Yes, sir. Spears popped another chunk into his mouth and chewed it thoughtfully. Been in combat against them in several theaters, correct? That's right, General. These men are military, marines. I know about them. What about you, little lady? Hicks saw that Newt couldn't bring herself to speak. Sir, he put in. Newt was on Acheron during first contact with the aliens. The only survivor. The general raised one of his thick eyebrows. Is that so? Dumbly, Newt managed to nod. She survived on her own for more than a month, Hicks said. The general's other eyebrow went up. Really? Most resourceful. How old would you have been then? Ten. Newt managed. Another one of the face-threatening smiles. Excellent. I envy you, you know. You've been in combat against the toughest enemies, the most dedicated soldiers men have ever faced. Perfect troops, fearless, tough, almost unstoppable. Your survival is quite an achievement. A fluke, really, but no less heroic for that. The only way to beat an enemy as hard as the one man now faces is to use troops of equal vigor ones who can match the ferocity of the opposition. That got through to Newt. You're trying to raise tame aliens here? With the proper leader, my troops could spearhead the retaking of Earth, Spear said. Think about it. What better way? The wild strain behave like ants. With troops of equal caliber plus proper strategy and tactics, they wouldn't stand a chance. Newt started to say something. Hicks kicked her under the table. She closed her mouth. Great idea, sir, Hicks said. The general nodded, pleased. I knew you would see it so, he said. You've been up against them. You know how little chance humans or even specially bred androids have. How can we help, sir? Hicks asked. Newt stared at him as if he had lost his sanity. He kicked her under the table again without changing his expression. If Spears noticed Newt's look, it didn't seem to register. Your experience, Sergeant. I have computer-generated scenarios, recordings of battles on Earth, theories. You have been there. You know the reality. I want your advice, your knowledge. My troops must be as well prepared as they can be when I formulate my strategy. Certainly, sir, Hicks said, stretched his own scarred face into a smile. I'm a Marine before anything else. And Newt wants to help, too. Isn't that right, Newt? Newt nodded. Right. Spears was practically beaming now. He raised his wine glass. A toast, then. But before the general could offer the toast, the Major came in. Spears frowned. What is it, Powell? Sorry to disturb your meal, sir. A security breach. The guard on the south lock has been assaulted. The outer door burned open. 
One of the land crawlers is missing. The general waved one hand. Oh, that. Powell blinked. Sir? This is my base, Major. I try to keep up. He looked at Hicks. You have to stay on top of things when you're the CO. Enjoy the rest of your meal. You are free to go anywhere on third base. You have full clearance. If you have any questions, Major Powell will be happy to answer them. I suppose I should go and see to the malcontents who have destroyed my military property. With that, he stood, gave Newt a military bow that was barely a nod, and left with Powell. Hicks stared at the General's back as he left, wished he had a gun at that moment. Newt found she was shaking. She wasn't sure if it was because she was afraid or angry. She stood, but Hicks was right there. He hugged her, and before she could do more than stiffen and start to pull away, he whispered, Play along, Newt. They probably have a cam on us and a voice recorder. She relaxed a little. What? If we don't do what this guy says, he is going to feed us to his monsters. Play along. And so they did. Days passed. Hicks and Newt explored the base. It was like a dozen such places Hicks had been on in his career. Standard hardware from the lowest bidder, as cheap as it could be, and still work. The one thing he noticed that bothered him wasn't the gear, but the people. There didn't seem to be enough of them for a base this size. If anything, the military usually had too many troops for the work needed. A larger command being what officers liked to wave at each other. Given the extent of the base, almost as big as a very small town, there ought to be several hundred more people staffing it. Hicks went to shower, water being one of the few things they had plenty of on the station. Piped up from some deep underground cave as ice chunks melted on the way up by heaters in the slurry conduits, SOP for this kind of operation. One of the few perks even grunts got. Alone, Newt wandered down the narrow hallways, feeling as if she were being watched. God, this was all so insane. Having spent years in a mental hospital because the authorities thought her memories were hallucinations, Newt had some experience with madness. This was right up there. Spears ought to be in a silicone room somewhere, doped to the hairline, scheduled for a full mental revision. He was bug-fuck crazy and should be put away. Instead, he commanded troops and had a personal nest full of the deadliest things man had ever encountered. What kind of deity would allow that kind of lunacy? Only one that was crazy itself. She came to a door marked Communications. It slid open as she approached. The tech sat there, staring at a series of flat screen monitors. The tech looked over, saw Newt. I heard we got visitors. Come on in. I got a notice says you're cleared for this area. Newt stared at the tech. Why the hell not? The door closed behind her. The old man on the screen was white bearded, his left arm bandaged crudely from wrist to elbow his clothes dirty and torn. He had an antique rifle lying next to him, something that appeared to be blued steel and worn wood, an old-style bolt-action piece, probably a hunting weapon from a hundred years past, back when people hunted for sport and not survival. He sat cross-legged, leaning against a pile of rubble, mostly broken furniture and shattered building material. A small campfire burned in front of him, the flickers from it painting the old man's face yellow-orange. A girl of about six leaned against the old man's side, her face dirty, long hair matted. Here comes Air Sammy, the old man said. Overhead in the night, the running lights of military attack jets appeared, red and green against the smog that was mostly smoke. The rumble of their engines increased. Will they see us, uncle? The little girl asked. I hope so, honey. They should. The fiery lance of a missile erupted from one jet, then other rockets followed. Like meteorites, the missiles streaked and died quickly to be replaced by a brighter flash of light, followed by artificial thunder as the rockets exploded. The little girl covered her ears with her hands as more explosions rocked them. The old man looked across the fire and spoke as if there were an unseen watcher sitting there. That's it for now, sports fans. Tune in again tomorrow, same time, same satellite, for another exciting episode of Life in the Ruins of Earth. We'll sign on at 1900 if the bugs haven't eaten us. Summer's over and it's getting dark sooner. That's a dislink and end it. Newt gripped the arms of the plastic form chair tightly and found she had been holding her breath as the image on the view screen went black. She forced herself to relax, to breathe. They're regulars, the tech said. Amy, Mona, Uncle Bert, sometimes Leroy. He's Chinese, we think. The kid looks to be about six. Our guess is that her mother is in her late twenties, some kind of the stuff she talks about. 
The old guy is maybe 70, probably not related, though the kid calls him uncle. God, Newt said. I don't know why they bother casting, the tech said. It's not like anybody is going to drop down and help them. Newt shook her head. Maybe it's all they have left. It matters that they try. People do that. The tech shrugged, scanning for another image. Or did it? This base location is classified information, he said. But I can tell you that the cast we just saw is history. Even in cold sleep and with full race G drives going through the hypercut, we are a long way from Earth. The little girl could be years older by now. That or worm food. It's a message in a bottle. Newt's insides clenched. She knew just how that little girl must feel. The images shifted on the various screens, sometimes people, sometimes test patterns, sometimes information blurring past so fast she couldn't begin to read it. A montage of humanity calling out to itself electronically, sending its voices and pictures out on invisible waves into the galaxy. Is anybody listening? Is anybody there? A woman appeared on the screen to Newt's left. She was attractive, dark hair chopped short in a spacer's cut, chiseled in even features, thin lips, good cheekbones. Who's that? The tech glanced over at the picture. He smiled. That's Ripley. Ripley? He looked at her as if she were not particularly a bright child. Ellen Ripley. THE Ripley. She was on the Nostromo and the Sulaco. She was there at the beginning, on LV-426, first contact with the aliens. Holds the record for long sleep, as far as we can tell. You've been living in a cave for the past few years? Yeah, you might say that. What happened to her? The tech fiddled with the control. Can't get the sound, sorry. This is a really old cast. We catch a few of them now and then, light speed being as slow as it is. Never know what you're gonna pick up. I can plug into the computer lip reader if you want. What happened to Ripley? The tech shrugged. Dunno. She was the only survivor of the Nostromo. Basically a bunch of truck drivers who sat down in the wrong place, at the wrong time, got infected. She later went back out to the colony as an advisor with a crew of colonial marines. The colony was destroyed in a nuclear explosion. Probably they all died. There were some rumors. Newt, exhausted, stared at the tech, waited. I had a buddy, used to work for a civilian biotech division of a major Terran company. He said Ripley managed to get off world before the place blew wound up on an old prison world somewhere. They sent somebody out after her, but that's where the story ends. A lot of shit got lost after the invasion. Who can say? You seem to know a lot about it. Not really. General Spears studies everything available on the aliens. Bunch of it gets routed through here. You pick stuff up. Newt stared at the woman on the screen. She felt a kind of kinship with her. How had she behaved when she faced those things? Was she alive somewhere, or blown to atomic dust, the same way Hicks had blasted the alien's homeworld? Or worse, webbed to a wall and used as a human incubator for a baby monster? The image faded. Newt leaned back in the chair and allowed the other vid pics to wash over her. They were hypnotic, light strobing, low sounds droning her into a kind of solemnness. Newt was dropping into a troubled sleep when the images shifted once more. It was the broadcast from earlier. The viewpoint changed, there was a quick disorienting flash on the ground, then the picture steadied on Uncle Bert, once again addressing the unseen viewer. It's... it's worst at night. You can't see them. You can only hear the screams. We usually avoid the buildings, too many places for those things to hide. Of course, nothing's really safe anymore. It's getting more difficult to maintain the uplink. Once the creatures destroy the relay station, will be cut off. People have been congregating near the first insurance plaza. We've heard rumors of a military food dump, fresh water. The old man paused. Hold it. The sounds of screams and a struggle could be heard from in the streets. Don't be afraid of her. Join her, came a deep and unseen voice. A second later, tall men in camo gear stepped into sight. The woman was being dragged, pleading with her captors. The Queen will be pleased with this one, the first soldier said. She will smile upon us. He looked around the clearing, what had once been a busy street in a major city. At the plaza center, there were no military food dumps, no water, no oasis that would harbor endurance of any human life. 
These congregations had been in honor of the alien queen. The bug feeders, as they had been called, were rumored to hunt down survivors and bring them to the queen as host for further soldiers in her army. The rumors were indeed true. You're only making it harder, the soldier said to his offering. Once she joins with you, there's no more pain, only the peace that comes from being with God. The uplink began to destabilize, static and distortion veiled the struggle that followed. Oh Jesus, they've dropped down behind us, the old man gasped. The image vanished. The scanners cycled, looking for another broadcast. Seated before the now blank screen, Newt was drenched in sweat, her heart pounding. A lot of them over there like that, the tech said. Not enough they have drones out hunting people, now they got traitors doing their work for them too. Hard to imagine why somebody would do that. Newt sighed. It was almost a sob. Yeah, it was hard to imagine, but there it was. Jesus, how could anybody sink that low? In this series, I'm recounting the Earth War, as depicted in the Aliens comic series. The accounts are explored as originally published, despite certain names, locations, and other events having been altered over time. For more on the Earth War, you can check out the accounts of the Earth War playlist on the end screen, and stay tuned for the latest videos. As always, I'd like to thank you very much for watching, I really appreciate it, and if you enjoy this video, please make sure to give it a like, and you can also subscribe for all the latest videos from Alien Theory. A very, very special thanks goes out to Wayland Jutani Executive, Emurik, part of the Patreon Hive. I'd also like to thank our Hive's Queen, Lady Anne. If you'd like to join the Hive and support the channel, check out my Patreon page for exclusive posts and contests. In the meantime, you can catch up with Alien Theory over social media. Follow at Alien underscore Theory on Twitter and at Alien Theory YT on Facebook and Instagram for more. And until next time, this is Alien Theory, signing off.